devil said to Jesus when he first confronted him in the wilderness of temptation? Remember what he said? If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus had become physically hungry after his long fast. But remember, Jesus' answer to this quick fix was, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Today we find Jesus and his disciples turning from Judea, going toward Galilee, and traveling part of the way through Samaria. They made a rest stop at Jacob's well. And John says, Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily. Traveling can make you tired. I have certainly felt that way after my return this week from the States. There's a lot of jet lag you have to adjust to and you just feel plain tired. Uh, you realize the distance you have gone. And along the way on this journey with traveling, I also felt tired at times. In our story, in our story today, apparently everyone was also hungry. For the disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. When you travel and make stops, food is always in the picture. Have you ever notice that? Whenever you make a stop somewhere, you get a bite to eat, as they say. Unless you are very early in the morning at the airport in Boston, that's where I was, before 6 o'clock, and then travelers are there, but there's no coffee. That's a tragedy. <laughs> when traveling by car, most stops include some food, and when you arrive at the destination, more food. I think I ate my way all through last month. Pizzas in abundance in Boston, fitting the Italian states of affair there, uh, and satisfying my hunger for pizza for the foreseeable future. <laughs> I think I eat more pizza there than I have in the last two years. <laughs> then general board meetings in Kansas City, the meat cap capital of the USA, with too much meat and too much sugar. And I put in a request for more veggies. <laughs> <laughs> then two more road stops with relatives including food in abundance and ending with a carrot cake on my birthday. Huh. That I gained weight during Lent seemed unavoidable, but also contra contrary to Lent somehow. I thought, oh, all this food and it's Lent, but there I was. <laughs> food is part of any celebration as you see today, and it's all good, it's all good. But here in our story, something else crops up. We read the part about the Samaritan woman, Jesus meeting her, and we're going to read in just a moment, John 4, 27 through 38. Jesus has talked with the Samaritan woman at the well, has sipped some water from her jug, amazing in itself, and Jesus ends their conversation by saying, I am Messiah. The disciples did not hear this, but look what happens next, our text. Then, just, just then, his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or, why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. 
Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God, who sent me, and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying, one plants and another harvests. And it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. The disciples were shocked. In Samaria, enemy territory, Jesus was talking to a woman unheard of. Unheard of. And now people from her village, more Samaritan people, mind you, are streaming in to see Jesus. I was thinking a real live stream. And what do the disciples say? Rabbi, eat something. Did they think that Jesus had had low blood sugar the whole time, sort of a delirium, and therefore he talked to this woman? Or did they not know what to say and thought of the bodily need for food? Or were they hungry themselves and couldn't wait to get started on their picnic? Eat something is often our first response when someone isn't feeling well. I've told people when they call me and say, I'm not feeling well, they say, well, have you eaten something? A normal thing, isn't it? Or when you're sitting around the table, is one of our first things we say, well, please eat some more, or why don't you have another helping? A bit more of this, or a bit more of that. When I first came to Germany and I was age 21, I was here in the summer, and I didn't really know a whole lot of German. And when I would be invited to somebody's house as a guest for coffee and kuchen, cake and coffee, I would finish a piece, and before I knew it, another piece was on my plate. <laughs> you know, I didn't know what exactly to say to tell them I've had enough. I mean, how do you say that properly in German so as not to offend somebody who wants you to eat two or three more pieces of their cake? With limited language skills, it was hard to be polite. And it's still quite a human thing, isn't it, to say to somebody, eat something? And here is just such a scene. But Jesus replies, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. What, Jesus, you have already eaten? Who brought you the food? And here's where the air becomes quite thin around Jesus. It's one of those thin places where the earthly place, into the earthly place comes another dimension, heavenly, that enters this picture. And let me back up so that this can be understood, I think. In my recent trip, I enjoyed most of the food. Not all the food. The huge pork chop that I had in Kansas City that was plumped on my plate. I must, I kid you not, it was about that big. I almost had a heart attack <laughs> when I saw it. I thought, how am I going to get through this pork chop? I passed some of it on to my neighbor. But had I just been in places to eat, it would not have been enough. What made the significant difference was contact and conversations with people. And I had a variety of them. And put that into this context, Jesus had just finished a conversation with this woman. He had just talked with her. He drank a cup of water from her cup. But he fulfilled her deep longings for conversations about things that truly matter, spiritual things. Like, 
where's the right place to worship Jesus? Or when the Messiah comes, will he explain all of these things to us? And then suddenly her eyes were open and Jesus says to her, I am the Messiah. Remember, later on, some of the Pharisees ask, are you the Messiah? Jesus is totally silent, never answers their question. In this place, he offers this description of himself to somebody who didn't even ask. But he knew her hunger to know. Remember Jesus' mission to seek and to save that which was lost. In this epiphany conversation with the Samaritan woman, he was doing the will of God. He says, my nourishment, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. I shared a conversation with Angela from the Cape Verde. She was sharing about her desire as a mother to teach her children about following after Jesus. She shared how she did that across the years. We had a good conversation. We ate the bread of life together without food. Or after hearing that one of our general superintendents lost his 43-year-old son last year, I could take his hand and simply Hold it and say, I can imagine your grief, for I too have a son who just turned 43. Bread shared. More nourishment. Or telling, talking to a niece of Christopher in Boston who asked me straight, I was so shocked, she asked me directly right between the eyes how to get her estranged uncle back into the family. He had had a discrepancy with the father and they were no longer present. She missed her uncle, she missed her cousin. She said, what can I do? How can we get them back? I shared words like forgiveness, reconciliation, and praying for hard hearts to be softened. That's nourishment of another kind and it goes beyond pizza. What is doing God's will in your life and in mine? In these moments we find true soul food, nourishment, nourishment which satisfies a different dimension than physical food. And then as if Jesus wanted to share this soul food with his disciples, he says, take a look around. This nourishment is all around you. There is the possibility of this harvest of helping people to enter the kingdom or to begin eternal life. And there is possibilities everywhere. And he wasn't meaning in the future you'll do this after Pentecost when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You notice Jesus didn't add on all of that dimension of futuristic time. It was right then. It wasn't a long way off. Why? The Samaritans were streaming in to meet Jesus. Streaming in from the village. And don't you suppose that some of these folk also spoke to the disciples? I can't imagine them just only with Jesus. I'm sure they asked the disciples, um, what has Jesus been doing? When did you decide to follow him? When did you start learning from him? How has your life been changed since you really spent time with Jesus? And do you think he's the Messiah? Jesus and the disciples stayed two full days with all of these Samaritans. And many heard the message and many conversations took place. And the disciples shared this new nourishment, doing God's will. That is a nourishment that Jesus wanted his disciples to experience and taste. Planting gospel seeds in hearts that were open and harvesting, bringing people into the realm of eternal life because where Jesus is, 
the kingdom of God is. And for the Samaritans, at the end of that chapter, it says, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, referring to the woman, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world after two days. One could ask, how long have you heard the message? Two days? Two years? 20 years? 40 years? When you have these deep spiritual conversations with people, you begin to sense that your life has been nourished in a totally different level. And we can begin to discover this satisfying soul food when we wake up and look around, as Jesus told his disciples. There are people right, ready to hear the good news. Do you think that today in your circle and where you are? Think about it. Who's ripe for harvest? And who's ready to let the seed fall in? There's two things going on. Jesus talks about planting and harvesting all at the same time. And the disciples, and we as disciples, can get engaged by doing the will of God. Not by theoretically talking about it, but by practicing it concretely in the life we are now living. Courage to live the love of God in our life right now. That is where Christian faith takes fire and form and we get nourished. And are glad. At one moment in the general board meetings, Carla Sundberg said, we don't have a harvest problem, we have a labor problem. Who will go? <clears throat> Who will get engaged? Are we hungry enough? Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for this good word. And we are longing to have a faith that is alive, that is really vibrating, full of energy. And Lord, we thank you that you have shown us again, if we do your will, then things catch fire and we're nourished. We get soul food from you. I thank you for that, Lord. And I pray that you'll help all of us to keep on the journey with you, Jesus. To keep seeing what you see. To keep doing what you do. And so get to know your Father more closely. Bless us. Together we pray and thank you for this time around your word. In your name we pray. Amen.